All right, welcome everybody to our next uh, virtual Monday lunch. Uh, we've got a, uh, we're very excited for the guests we have today and we've got Billy Lucci with TechSags. Uh, he's gonna answer all your questions. And before we get to Billy, uh, we've got Bill Hill, our uh, president, class of 84, with a quick update on the club. Bill, how you doing? Hey, great, Logan, and thanks for everything you do for the club. And, uh, you know, I, I just got to say, we got to stop meeting like this. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm tired of meeting in these virtual Monday lunches. And uh, unfortunately, about three weeks ago, we were pretty optimistic that we would be meeting at Aggie Park today. Uh, but instead, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be video uh, live streaming this uh this presentation and we hope to reach a, a large audience and uh, we'll work through all this the best we can. You know, this is a very difficult time. On one June, the seven day average in San Antonio for COVID-19 cases was about 50 a day. And then uh, last week I reported that it had bumped up to 473 a day. In the paper today, five, uh, on, on the paper in five July, it was 700 a day. So this uh, this COVID-19 thing, it's uh, it's 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 very difficult, and I don't know where we're going to go. We're going to do the best we can uh, to provide uh, for the AM club as best we can. So, as I've reported before, we've postponed most of our events, and some of our events, like the Monday lunches on a on a weekly weekly basis, have been postponed or canceled. Uh, we don't know about coaches' night. We're optimistic that we'll get some word on that in the near future. We don't really know when we're going to be able to meet again on Monday lunch. Now, the board of directors and the club continues to move forward. We're we're meeting most of the time by virtual, and uh, and, and we're taking care of business and we're doing some of the things we need to get done. Hey, look, I do want to talk about some positive new news, and again. Um, if you were here last week or the week before, I apologize, but I imagine we're going to reach some people that we haven't touched before on this Monday lunch. One thing real positive is that we had our scholarship luncheon on June 22nd. We had approximately 10 students came and they provided an update on their experience at A&M. And uh, it was quite entertaining, some of them with uh, how they dealt with COVID-19 and so forth. But uh, we've had over 175 people watch that uh, that video and 60 people watched it live. The bottom line is that we continue to provide scholarships every year to Bear County uh, students that are going to A&M. And this year uh, there were, uh, we just also finished our scholarship application process in which 140 potential students applied for our scholarship. We, we narrowed that down to 25 and we interviewed 25 and uh, as I understand it, the committee has selected eight for um, scholarships. So that will be presented to the board of directors here next month. That scholarship's $12,000 over the life of uh, four years at A&M. And uh, feedback that we get from our students is that it's, uh, it's well, very well received and very well needed. And just to give you an idea of the quality of our students, 15 of our students on scholarship uh, posted a 4.0 GPA. That's right. You heard it right. 15, which is over half of them. And all of our students posted over a 3.5. That's remarkable on a year to year basis. Hey, um, one last thing I'm going to do before I turn it over to uh, Logan and Billy is I want to talk about our campaign, our capital campaign. Now, you guys know that uh, Aggie Park, we've got plans to expand that about 30 feet with a uh, with a porch on the outside of that, plus renovate the inside, which is sorely needed. Um, those plans have been uh, completed for quite some time, and the total price tag on that is $1.6 million. Now, we made a lot of progress on that, but we've got some more work to do. I just wanted to give you an update. Even though we're not actively uh, fundraising, although I mentioned it in the uh, Monday lunches, we received on top of, of really $35,000 last year, we received another $10,000 donation this last uh, week since we talked last. And that was matched by the Mays Family Foundation to equal $20,000. So where do we stand on the $1.6 million? Well, as of today, 
we have raised $1,041,976. Wow, that's um, a little over $20,000 over last week. And to get to 1.6 million, that requires only $279,000 now. That $279,000 will be matched by the Mays Fa Family Foundation. We'll have the 1.6, and then we can kick off the groundbreaking and renovation and expansion of Aggie Park. So that's a quick update from your San Antonio A&M Club. I wish I had better news on when we're gonna meet again and when the next activity is going to be, but we're working hard at that. And we're doing all the things we still need to do to bring the Aggies together in Bear County. So with that, Logan, I turn it over to you and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing this great presentation. Hey, thanks, Bill. That's exciting news with the capital campaign. Uh, well, uh, we've got the Billy Lucci with TechSax uh, joining us today, and uh, we're real excited about that. Billy, how's, uh, how's your, uh, how was your holiday weekend? How's it going? Well, probably like many, it was pretty low key, you know, stayed here in College Station and uh, just like everyone else, just hoping uh, we're that much closer to college football season. We'll see. We'll see. There's so many unknowns right now, and I'm sure that's what uh, some of the questions will have to do with. But just, uh, you know, a low-key holiday. I feel like that's what we keep having. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July. Um, waiting for those ones, I guess, where everybody can cut loose again. Definitely. Uh, you heard how the, the pandemic's uh, affecting us at Aggie Park and now all we're doing. Uh, I know it's got to be affecting you guys. Uh, how's, how's it uh, been affecting TechSax, the membership, the viewership? Is it up, down, normal? It's probably actually up than it is a, a normal off season at this time. You know, we missed a lot in the spring, whereas you would have had March Madness, a and M wouldn't have been a part that year had they unless for a you know wild uh, in SEC tournament run. But college baseball, all the spring sports, um, even even things like the NBA finals and and NH NHL, whatever. Now you'd be in you know we'd be probably right around the All Star break right now in baseball. So I think this off season from about the spring was down. This has been an active off season. Unfortunately, in some instances, you know, not for all the right reasons that you wish it would be, but uh, it's been busy. There's been a lot to talk about, and I think uh, myself and probably most Aggies listening today, we're, we're all sitting here going, well, I hope we have A sports, but in particular our, our Aggie sports to talk about come uh, really come August. But depending on what happens in, in the state and in the various states, you know, July 13th, A&M is going to resume team football activities for the first time since basically when they broke for spring break and thought they were coming back for spring football. They weren't. Well, now a week from tomorrow, they're coming back. And I think Jimbo and, and the coaching staff will be, even though some of them have stayed in town, including Jimbo, but they'll be like all together back at the Bright Complex beginning this week in, in preparation for the whole team arriving next week. What's that, uh, what's that done for recruiting, uh, just not being able to travel, not being able to get around and, and uh, reach out? How's that? It, I think it's been a little bit of a disadvantage for A&M because they've been doing – they kind of got hit with two disadvantages here, one of which was the way they had set it up and, and who was to know what was coming in the way of a global pandemic that happens once every 100 years, but – it was kind of ramping up to spring football. Uh, they had had the big Super Bowl function, and sp spring ball from the start of spring ball to the end uh, was going to be kind of that ramp up, build up, and then they were literally poised to hopefully get a bunch of commitments uh, at the spring game. They were trying to kind of set that up as a big event. And what happened was you went into this, this shutdown of recruits not being able to visit campus. So – when A&M had a lot of guys there Super Bowl Sunday, which was the first weekend of February, A, if they didn't come then, they probably weren't there since before December or even, you know, the end of college football season. If they were, that was still the start of February, and then things shut down around mid-March. So most of the guys they were targeting had been somewhere else, if not multiple places, 
since last CNA and M. So it hurt them on that front with the in-state. And I think the shutdown hurt teams like A&M and really there are a lot of teams that recruit nationally. So it kind of hurt everybody equally in that regard, because if you're recruiting nationally, the fact is you're just not getting guys here. I think since March, A&M's had one recruit on campus. They couldn't even visit with him. That was just a safety from Pennsylvania that decided he wanted to come walk around and see the stadium and see the campus and the town with his family. And that that's it. So it's hurt everyone. Uh, but A&M, uh, along with a lot of other schools, seems to have recovered. They got a big commitment on Saturday from a cornerback they've wanted for a long time. And I think uh, about their, their last three commitments here, four, three or four commitments have been long time uh, coveted guys. So they seem to be gaining some momentum and are probably not done between now and uh, the start of the season. How is, uh, if you can give us a quick rundown, I know most people have heard already, but about the probation that the Aggies have been put on and uh, how that, how that could affect us or might affect us uh, come, you know, in the next few seasons. I don't think it'll affect them at all in the next few seasons. I think it'll affect them. Uh, it, there's some little effect now because when you see these headlines, I think Jimbo probably got out in front of it right when, right when the sanctions went down and, and kind of, if you can sit there and explain to a prospect and his family, look, here, here's what it is. This is all it is. This is all we did. I think that's important too, to say, look, this is not like what you're thinking of. This is not scandal. This is not blatant cheating. This is a bump into a kid uh, for longer than the NCAA was comfortable with, you know, out of state. And this is uh, seven hours total of extra practice time that was really just if you're not early you're late kind of thing uh you you're in a transition from one coaching staff to the other i i've been around unfortunately too many of those and i know that when they come in you've got to re reset and reset the culture i mean it's not a knock on Sumlin that it deteriorated that because what he inherited he had to do the same thing it's just as, as something wanes down if you guys are going to be coming in late you better all be here 15 minutes early. So if we're going to start at 2.30, you start at 2.15. They added all that up. It came out to seven extra hours. I, I thought the whole thing was absolutely ridiculous when you look at college basketball and, and the real issues facing college football, not to mention the pandemic, not to mention the uh, NLI, you know, name, image, NIL, name, image, and likeness stuff that I feel like the NCAA has just completely dropped the ball on and – yeah, I do think they uh, sometimes go out and want to get, you know, just show that they're still functioning and still doing something. Because to me, it feels like they're scared to go after the big, the big hits that will take out Kansas basketball or North Carolina basketball or Coach K and Duke, LSU football. Like it's like they don't want to go after the big, so they like to prosecute a bunch of small just to show they're still viable and I think that's what they did in this case I think it was the whole thing was ridiculous um, fortunately even though I think the punishment did not fit the crime it's not a lingering punishment in other words there's no scholarship reductions uh, and there's no bowl ban or anything like that so it's it's clean and done and now you know A&M's got to stay clean while on probation and it's over and done with so I think the headlines were uh, you know the headlines logan were like if you read them you think probation fisher hit was show cause and then you read the article and you go okay so schools are going to try to use that against a&m so they're just going to have to put out one fire after the other and just say hey look here here's the actual report if you look at that to me i would turn that around and say if this coach is telling you this, he's deliberately misleading you. Here's the truth. That should tell you a little something about that coach and the kind of program he runs. So who's keeping track of, of to, down to that detail, um, and players showing up early for practice? Is there like an NCAA rep or something at every practice? No, I think uh, it was started with the santino Marchial investigation. And so that's what – that he, he, he made those allegations and, and really – seem like made them to a much more extreme level than it turned out to be. And so that is why in, in, in USA Today and uh, Dan Walken, who I believe is makes his in, entire existence based on going after uh, college coaches. It's like skin on the wall, prove uh, that newspapers still matter type thing. Um, and so 
that that I think is where this it is. I don't think I know that's where it began, and uh, it led to that investigation. And over two years, that's what they found. So if you're wondering what kind of program Fisher and A and M are running, that's what they found in two years of of uh, looking around and try to find what was going wrong here in College Station. That's pretty positive. That's good. Um, the, is, how does the probation of, of, of recruiting from that particular high school, uh, is that a school that there's a lot more recruits coming in from? Is that like an academy or anything? Or? No, it's not. And I know a lot of people have wondered. And I just, I haven't really uh, felt like airing out who the prospect was or who the school was. He, he goes to a different, he goes to a different school. Uh, that A&M I don't think has recruited before or since. And it's, I'll just say it's completely out of the SEC footprint. And for those wondering, A, if it was in state or, or if it was like, I know people have wondered, oh, I hope it's not a, an IMG or something like that where there's a yeah. lot of prospects. The answer is no. And it's just, it's just it was a one-off uh, with a player they had at an out-of-state school. Good deal. Um, Assuming there is uh, a season, which uh, I think we're all hoping for, how do you, how do you foresee the NCAA re um, regulating uh, COVID testing? Oh, wait. I was going to say, too, because this is something that a lot of people have asked me on the site. The other thing I, I saw were in Dallas Morning News, I don't know if it was Blackstone or one of those writers, had suggested that it was an SEC team that turned A&M in, and this was kind of what took down the Southwest Conference, is, and, and that's kind of what's about – maybe this is a foreshadowing of what's happening in the SEC. Another, I just I thought, completely asinine, uninformed article. It had nothing to do – it was literally one of A&M's players, and then the whole bump thing happened. It's actually Jimbo's not the only coach that will end up uh, being in trouble in that instance. I mean, it was uh, – Kind yeah, of something that was going Alabama on in that getting, school. Alabama getting well, in Alabama, I think they might. It might be for that too. But Alabama's getting something as well, and and or they theirs is going to be less because it's not the head coach, and that's what the NCA said made it a level two violation. Whereas it's an assistant, it's a level three. So that's that whole you know splitting hairs thing there. But point being. Uh, it had nothing to do with anything SEC related. And just to even further clarify, the prospect in question did not attend an SEC school. So, anyways. Well, oh, uh, COVID. You asked about yes. COVID. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how, how do you, you know, how do you foresee that, that NCAA regulating COVID 19 testing throughout the season, you know, assuming we're playing? Again, to me, something much more important than slapping A&M on the wrist uh, for show for, for a ridiculous investigation would be worrying about the integrity of the sport, the integrity of the game and things that threaten that, like what we see on the HBO, the HBO show with the wiretaps in, in, in basketball, accusations like what you're seeing about Zion Williamson. I said name, image, and likeness. I think the one-year transfer exemption and, and are they going to turn college football into free agency and what kind of tampering is that going to lead to? Things like that. So if you think some of these big-name players that have transferred from A&M, and, and, you know, under Sumlin and stuff, if you think that they weren't already in touch with other programs, you're insane. Uh, so these are things that I think affect, like, the very fabric of the game, not 15 minutes of extra practice time over the course of a week. So to me, like the COVID testing, do you want this to be a real season if you're fortunate enough to have one? How, why is there not uniform uh, testing across the board, a system in place uh, where a third party is testing at all these programs? I mean, it's not like there's 7,000 of them. There's 130 or so of them. Uniform testing, third party you know, they have to be tested, obviously, you know, at least every week. And then those kids that are in question, maybe multiple times in a week, but have it be uniform third party, because what if this coach over here decides I'm going to do this the right way. And if you're my quarterback and you have it, you're sitting, even if you're asymptomatic, if four of my D linemen have it and only one of them shows any symptoms, guess what? Or four of my D linemen are sitting, not have it, if four of them are, are – two of my D linemen have it and five of them are in isolation now because 
we found out on a Thursday and we don't know if they have it Saturday, they're not playing. Do you think every school will do that? There are some schools that will play the positive COVID quarterback in a big game if he doesn't have symptoms because if they can figure out a way around the training staff. Now, here's my other thing. Some coach or coaches will get fired and lose their many million dollar jobs over this because if you keep playing that game, somebody's going to get caught. A kid, their parent, another player are going to say, oh, well, this guy played with COVID and they will be fired from a many million dollar a year job. So on the one hand, I think you have to be really careful. On the other hand, I think there are going to be people that maybe for a big game, somehow your quarterback doesn't get tested that week. So unless that is completely uniform across the board, what are we even doing? Because it's not going to be a real champion as soon as one game is impacted by an uneven playing field. Yeah, it seems like there's uh, definitely some advantage out there for, uh, say, like Clemson's got 40-something players already. Yeah. They're already tested out. I mean, they're, they're good to go for the season. And uh, just it's going to be interesting. Uh, my biggest concern, Logan, is this, are, are the states. Like we, we, you, I, I was listening at the beginning. We know what's going on in San Antonio, even College Station, Dallas, use all over Texas, even the smaller counties. Um, we know what's going on in places like Arizona and Florida, and it's, it's skyrocketing in a lot of places. It's what the states decide, I think, that's going to determine the college football season because Clemson isn't the only team with a huge spike in cases early. In fact, I would tell you that virtually every school in the country when those kids came back had a big spike because if one or two of them had it when they report out of 100 guys – and all the staff, it ends up being like 150, 180 people, not to mention the other sports. That spreads like wildfire because they're college kids. They're going to bars. They have roommates. They're hanging out. They, they're hanging out with their girlfriends. All their buddies are back. They're all together. It's not happening, and you hear this everywhere. It's not happening in the weight room because that is complete control. They're better off there than they are at Gold's Gym or training out at their – local high schools or, or, or training facilities. This is like they are – and are also getting tested and treated regularly. It's out socially that they're getting it, and, and you're seeing that in the 20- to 30-year-old ranks throughout the whole country right now. So I think every school, if they were really just putting numbers out there like the CDC does, you'd see an immediate jump and a very rapid fall. And uh, schools like Clemson, Alabama, A&M – uh, LSU, some of these schools that reported at the start of June to voluntary workouts, and if most of the team was there, they've probably got a pretty good number infected and also a, a ton of them recovered by now. I think it's the states. Like, if, if Texas shuts down for two, three weeks, and, and we go three weeks from now, all of a sudden, do you even have time to get ready for a September 1 start of football? And the answer is probably no. Yeah, that would be uh, disappointing if, if we get to that, but probably the least of uh, the country's worries. But yeah. uh, well, let's let's uh, switch gears a little bit and uh, get away from all the, get away from the COVID. Uh, so you've seen Jimbo for a couple years. Uh, can you can you give us a ranking? Well, you've been around. Let's see, since R.C. Slocum, uh, Franchoni, Sherman, Sumlin. Can you give us a ranking? Uh, of those coaches with uh, in terms of recruiting on field performance coaching staffs and and your access to each one's program yeah I think you know over the years it's it's been every every coaching staff has been really good you know to work with they really have and I know some of them there's like a, a negative connotation for how things ended or whatever but I've I've just never really had an issue that you know we people forget we're we're media and people forget their, you know, like coaching staffs are not only allowed to deal with us, they, they should, not just tech sags, but all media. And, uh, and I've been here long enough that I think when people come through, there's, there's a layer of, of trust there. There's always just enough turnover where, you know, if you do things the right way, then you can be, you can be trusted to, you know, be an insider and, and, you know, be able to kind of be the conduit between bright, and, and uh, the fan base. I think it's great for Aggies. It's a great thing. Lord knows there are plenty of people that, that 
come, unfortunately come at us and come at tech sags and they think you know that we're like the evil empire or something but i think it's a great thing for aggies and we work on it you know time and time again i mean yeah it's it's been different coaches different ad's different uh, in all sports you know the players are all, ever changing ever changing and so it's been fun doing that and, and that's always a challenge but coaches have generally been great um in all sports there are very few that you'd ever hear me complain about in terms of here's what i'll say i watched rc slocum as a student and then you know early on in my college days and kind of how this whole thing got started and i was living with some of the players uh i always joke around because i know rc used to think i was like an agent like working for an agent he'd see me around with his players like who is that guy and you know i was just like a college kid and those were my roomies um that kind of you know evolved into the opportunity right as i was getting out of college of what i've what i'm doing today obviously it's a lot looks a lot different than it did at that time but kind of what I decided to do instead of use my my ID degree but it's been so I watched RC so I have a great deal of respect and appreciation for what he did from the time I started covering him was 98 so the, the Big 12 championship year was my first year and then you know then the last few years they started to lose some more games after that there were some high moments for sure but uh, those last three years or four years or so they started to lose games as much but I remember the glory days as a student and right up until my first year so I think Jimbo Fisher is on par with with RC in terms of uh just the way if you go to like the prime years of RC now the way he recruits and the way just the the in Jimbo's resume is is better than almost anyone that's coached in the last 30 years if you really look at it so as a coach, I think Jimbo is uh, – he's one of the – easily one of the five best in college football, period. I mean, wait – you have to wait and see what happens at A&M, and I know everyone wants it to happen really fast, but they're in the toughest league and toughest division in college football. And, the, and if you look at how they're recruiting, they're going to be there. They're going to get there. And I, I hope they play this year because I think this year will be a big, big step, the biggest one they've taken yet towards getting there on the field and then you'll see the recruiting fall out you know it's going to get even better than it's been but recruiting wise Jimbo reminds me of RC and his staff reminds me of RC staff in the, in the early to mid 90s in that the eye for yes they can go get the five star they can you guys are in San Antonio they can go get DeMarvin Leal they can get Jalen Jones who by all accounts, it looks incredible so far. It would, I could absolutely see him starting as a true freshman and being really good from day one. They can go get Demon Demas. They, and then it, they can do that in state. Uh, Bobby Brown was another example. They can, they can get the elites, Kenyon Green, Baylor Cup, those guys, which is what you used to see RC do. But then they also can go – out of state, which wasn't really a thing back in the day, because I think travel wasn't as the, the world wasn't as open as it is now between social media and traveling and things like that. But they can go out of state and get Donnell Harris and McKinley Jackson, these guys that are like borderline five star players. They can go get Fadil Diggs out of New Jersey. They got, again, they got a corner Saturday from Pennsylvania. So they can go do that. Uh, Chris Morris out of, out of Memphis. But here's the thing I really think is similar. No matter how good they recruit, what RC and his staff used to do in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and what Jimbo's doing now with his staff, they're not afraid to go get a three-star guy and, and, and take a guy that they think, A, fits their program, fits their system, but B, has the potential to be elite. In other words, don't pay attention to those services and go get guys – like Anaya Smith, even Jalen Weidemeyer has proven so much better already than his ranking was. But there's a lot of guys that we haven't even seen yet because he's only had two full recruiting classes. So watch where those things go. You know, you hate to lose Jay Sean Corbin, but he was another one of those guys. Had he stayed, you know, he, he might be on, uh, set for a star 
you know, all SEC run this year as a junior running back. So that's what I really like is, is Jimbo will run the gamut as a recruiter, and that's what makes him great. I'm sure you you might have covered this, but why did Jay Sean take off? Uh, I know, you know, I, he got injured in the Clemson game, but. Uh... I think when he was injured, you know, he was just a little detached from everything, uh, you know, just distance from the program, you know, the, as a season's going on and you're rehabbing from a significant injury and, and he had that, that hamstring surgically repaired, which is a major injury. So he wasn't even like necessarily training, you know, in the weight room and stuff. And I think just going home and I think family pulled him back. I really do. I think it was as simple as that. I think family pulled him back and, you know, that that's, it's one of the things when you go out of state, the guys that don't play as early, you still got to, you know, fight to get, keep them from getting homesick. But then again, nowadays, anybody that doesn't play early is, is keeping a close eye on that portal. It feels like. Well, best, best of luck to him. And, uh, You've mentioned the glory days. Uh, I was, uh, I, I always, I used that same term. I was a kid watching those games, uh, the '90s. RC Slim. Right. There's so many great players. What is really the, uh, what's the best, what's the best game? Your favorite game that you've uh, watched in person? Uh, and, and it doesn't even have to be football. Whatever, uh, football, mm. basketball. Uh, I've seen awesome. some some amazing ones outside of A&M. You know, game five of the World Series, Astros and Dodgers. Uh, and the national championship between Villanova and UNC, just kind of those double last-second shots. Um, been at like a Conor McGregor, uh, Nate Diaz fight at UFC, which was – that was an incredible event to see. Uh, and the Super Bowl, Tom Brady and, and the 28-3 to comeback against the Falcons. So I've seen some of those. To me, some of my all-time favorites are, are – if I did my top ten, probably six of them would be A&M games. And uh, basketball, I think it was A&M beating Louisville in Rupp Arena to advance to the Sweet 16 at a time when you thought maybe they'd make a run at the whole thing with A.C. Law and Joe Jones and Billy Clyde. That was a special party there at Rupp. And – so few Aggies, so many Louisville fans, and to that night and, and driving home or flying home. Beating Alabama in Tuscaloosa might be number one. Watching that game from, from the sidelines that day was – I'll never forget it. Uh, and then, again, going around. It's something about being in those towns that night and Alabama fans, and they see your A&M stuff, and they're like, you know, Johnny football, hey, great game. You know, it's just – that was incredible. Uh, the bonfire game in 99, absolutely. I, to me, one that, that Nebraska in 98, that was, that was just a fun, fun day. And, and living with those guys at the time, I'll tell you the two thing, one thing that Nebraska 98 and the Bama 2012 have in common, both those teams knew all week they were winning that game. And, and that was something Jason Glenn and Cornelius Anthony and Lonnie Madison were telling me the other day. I did a Zoom with them, and they, were, they all said, that week things were different, and we knew it. And that's the same way before that uh, Alabama game. I remember saying, telling Sumlin good luck down there before the game on the field, and he said, don't need it. And Cliff coming up to me saying, we're going to run these guys out of here today. And they almost did. It was 20 to nothing at the end of the first quarter. But just that level of confidence, Johnny, all everybody was loose. Um, I've seen A&M look really tight going into Alabama games several times since. That wasn't one of those times. Short uh, list. I notice I left off the 98 Big 12 championship game because, like an idiot, I chose not to – head up there and, and attend it. But I'll chalk that up to inexperience being brand new uh, into the thing. And 98 was my first season to cover the Aggies. That, that's pretty wild. I, I was uh, I'm lucky enough to attend the, the uh, Nebraska game and the uh, Alabama game that you, oh, wow. you talked about. Um, actually tr went down on the field after the Nebraska game. It was uh, pretty wild. Picked up a oh, recruit. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I want to pick up say, me, me and my cousin, uh, Jason, he's now a pastor. Uh, he might not appreciate me telling this, but we uh, <laughs> found some 
shot some recruit passes, uh, name tags on the ground. We put them on. We went back in the locker room with the team and listened to R.C. Slocum's uh, post-game speech. It was, uh, it was a pretty cool experience to be a part of that. That's He's pretty awesome. He, he could have he could have led the team prayer. Me, while, while he was in there, he should have just done well, that. Well, that was before he knew he was going to be a pastor, I'm sure. Uh, and they were definitely looking at us going, uh, who is recruiting me? So we were 14, 14 and 12. So they were going, who are, who are these hey. kids? Uh, what, what position do they play? And nowadays, I feel like we start covering them at that age. It's sad. That's why I don't call the recruits anymore. I've got Broninger and Howell to do that. But, you know, it's funny. That sounds like a great Texags thread after, it, you know, had that been around in, at that time. So I snuck into the – locker room in 98 you know stuck into the locker room and listened to rc talk to the team after nebraska that would have made a threat of its own like the kid that snuck on the sidelines of the uh bama game in 2012 one of the all-time classic uh tex ags threads yeah that's pretty awesome hey what uh, speaking of road games what's what's uh, your favorite road game you've been to or a bit or you know uh stadium that you've been to in the sec or i guess anywhere really Anywhere, I mean, Clemson was cool, really hot, though, and it wasn't just a great game. I'll tell you what, my favorite so far, and I'll be honest, I never went to Nebraska. I never went to Lincoln. I, I screwed that one up. So that's the only one, though, in the Big 12. Like, none of the other Big 12 ones would, would rank in the top six, seven in the SEC. Oklahoma and OU, I mean, and Texas included. They wouldn't be in the top six or seven in the, in the SEC. Um, I mean, they, none of those rank ahead of Baton Rouge, um, Auburn, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kyle Field. You're already up to six, and I'm sure I just left something out. Even Williams Bryce is – Yeah, even – Yeah, so to me, my, my favorites so far have been Athens and Georgia – this year that was really cool and I was even glad. with the rain <laughs> yeah even with the rain i was really glad that AM came back and made a game a real game of it in the fourth quarter there because i got to see the intensity ramp up you got to hear it loud when the sun was setting and and defense they're you know making big plays like that was i got the we got the full experience and then florida was we didn't get it at its peak but it yeah. was a night game, and it was like they sang. It was shortly after Tom Petty had died, so they, they had just started that tradition. That was really cool. That gave you goosebumps. But you're sitting there like, okay, if they're really good and imagining when they were winning championships and if they get there again, you could see where that place would have been really one of the best atmospheres in college football. Yeah, that, that million-dollar tailgate didn't uh, live up to its name that, that year, for sure. No. But, uh, okay, uh, let's see. You, what's your – I got another question here from one of our members. What's your favorite team you secretly root for outside of A&M? Well, I grew up – I grew up like – you know, I had no ties to A&M. You got to remember, like, my family moved from New York when I was five years old. We moved, we literally moved to Sugarland, Tech. I think we were in like Quail Valley, Texas. Really? And then, and yeah, and then Sugarland. Sure, yeah, I was right. I was there. right there. I went to like Meadows Elementary, and I think so Bucky we, Richardson lives right there. Oh yeah, Bucky. All a lot of a lot of recruits and a lot of Aggies there. So I grew up there, but we moved from New York. So I had zero family ties to any school down here. Um, more, you know, coming from New York, most of my relatives, they're Yankees, uh, Giants, Jets, Mets. They're pro sports fans up in the Northeast more than anything else. So I didn't really have. So I, I liked Mike Rozier and I like Nebraska a little bit. But I, I really, I would say Michigan was a school I really like. I like Syracuse basketball a lot. So I just, you know, I didn't really attach until – came to A&M. So then I fell in love with everything about it. Came to Bonfire my senior year of high school, fell in love with everything about it. Had some, my good buddies were coming. Uh, one of whom's a doctor down there in San Antonio right now and uh, has been for a while. So that to me, I, 
I like to this day, who do I like and kind of watch and root for? A lot of times it has to do with coaches or who's where. Um, I, I, I like, uh, I don't mind Penn State right now. I kind of like what they got going with that atmosphere there. I, I, James Franklin's a good coach, and I don't think he's elite, but I think he's good. I, I, I don't mind seeing them succeed. I, I, I like the idea of somebody like Oregon becoming really good. I, I feel like I wish there were more schools out west, not many, but just even a couple that would be really good just to really – make things interesting, but I, I don't have another school, I guess, that I sit there and root to win outside of a and I, I do like, uh, I do like whoever's beating the crap out of Texas at the time, you know, if it's Oak State, TCU, Baylor, I, I mean, shockingly, Baylor has been just really pleasant to follow since A&M's left the big 12 because they've done a number on the horns in, in a lot of sports, including football. So, and, and, and you can't, you get, you got to root for OU one day out of every year. Although I will say Lincoln Riley and all his dry fit uh, Nike air Jordan apparel and thinking he's as cool as he does is it, it wears you thin. Although if they keep recruiting quarterbacks like that, they're not going anywhere. So my, my little secret, pipe dream for this season is actually A&M, you know, getting to that 10 win mark and being in the cotton bowl against Oklahoma. I would love to see that. I would love to see, because how funny would it be if A&M played them a second time in the cotton bowl and proved to four and one in five bowl games against the big 12 since leaving and two and oh, with a couple beat downs of OU that that would be, I think that would be really epic. In the year, maybe beating LSU and Oklahoma back to back. Just saying. Hey, that was one of my one of my favorite games is watching uh, Bill Stoops just watch stomping the sideline, turning oh. beat red. That was a great beatdown. I love that the game. Funny part of that story, and you mentioned Bucky. We're on the field at halftime of that game, and, and Johnny walks over, and he's just talking, 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 and Beatty has to come grab him. He's like, Johnny, come on, and. uh but he's sitting there and he goes, we're about to run these guys out of the stadium. I'm like, really? He's like, we are going to, he was like, they're so bad. And he's like, we're going to just destroy them. He's like, it's sad that the score is what it is. I go, well, just win. It's 14, 13. I can't stand these. He's like, he goes, this is going to be payback for 77, nothing. He was like, that's how bad we're about to beat them. And, and, me and Bucky were like, all right. And, and you believed it. You believed it. And he went out, and I think the second half, I think they outscored him 28 nothing in the second half and probably could have been worse. It was. It was a beatdown. It was, it was a much more of a beatdown than the score showed, the final score yeah. showed. Uh, but uh, you, you uh, kind of brought me to the next question. As who do you hate more, TU or LSU? I'll say this, I got more friends it, it, that were burnt orange than were purple and gold. And uh, man, the LSU, people on like social media and Twitter for LSU, just, I didn't realize how unbearable they are. I mean, you could have something to do with, you know, TCU and, and Rice, and there'll be some LSU fan that comes in there taking shots at A&M or whoever. I mean, it's nuts, but I was still saying – I'll still say Texas as long as they've got Tom Herman. Not a fan. Not a fan at all. Um, but LSU's catching them. I think that's such a big game for LSU – for A&M this year is LSU at home. I mean, beat them and you end your year beating them so you have a chance to beat them to end the year and, and win a, a significant bowl game probably. So you talk about going in with some real momentum. But also to beat the nat defending national champs. Uh, which would be the second time since you've been in the SEC you've done that. And then also to just say, we've beaten them two out of three. So now you've either turned that into a home and home series. You've beaten them two out of three. You proved 74, 72 wasn't a fluke. And, you, you, you know, I just think you've got to turn that series into where the home team wins it every year. I mean, you'd like to do more, but at the minimum, you've got to beat them at home. 
You do that first, then start worrying about Bama, you know, because I think that that's the final frontier step, right? And then I still – I'll say that LSU game is that important. The biggest game of the year, and up to that point, I think the biggest game for Jimbo since he's been here will be Auburn on the road. At Auburn, uh, what that could set up potentially – with a win in that game, I mean, you start thinking about that and you start getting pretty excited. I'm always excited about Aggie football. Uh, couple, I got a, uh, about three quick questions here. Okay. Uh, best barbecue in uh, Bryan College Station? Oh, I don't want to say that because I don't want to leave anybody Please. out. But, but uh, I've always loved, I've always loved Fargo's out there in Bryan and, and now there's Cooper's uh, which I've, I've always loved. I've been to the, you know, I get, I'm thinking it's the original Cooper's in, in Atlanta. Atlanta. So that was when I was in college. So that one, and then I, I know the owners, they're good people and great people, great Aggies. So that's been really nice to have that in town now as well. But uh, I was going to wear my boy, you know, my two favorite places out of town that I always support no matter what is my good friend from A&M Shane Styles and uh Styles Switch there in Austin which is great and he's come and done it for Tex Ags and when, whenever I'm in Austin I always want to go by there uh assuming I can get the whole group to stop on our way home and then uh Snow's barbecue my man Carrie over there at Snow the whole family the whole group there some of my favorite people in, in on the planet and I don't get down there enough. And I know they're, you know, like all of us, they're going through it, trying to get open and keep it going. But snows is, is always anybody that I want to bring, you know, anybody that comes from out of state or anybody that's new here. Like, in other words, I don't know if Jimbo's been to snows yet. Jimbo needs to get, get to snows or have snows, you know, somebody on his staff go get it because, that's my spot, you know, whenever I have the time on a Saturday morning. I'd love to be able to make it, but I, I can't. It's a long line before a football game to try to catch that on the way into town. Yeah. Uh, okay. If, uh, if, the, if Maroon and White Report doesn't take off and, and you're not sitting here as Billy Lucci today, where, 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 would, you, where would you be? What would you be doing? It's funny. That is so much tied into, like, my uh, – identity I guess so many people associate the two right but uh, I mean I was I graduated with an ID degree so I guess I would have gone that direction but you know it's funny at the time I was it was like Jerry Maguire was out all my roommates were getting drafted uh, I probably would have figured out a way to get into like at the time all you thought I was like to work, you know, be an agent. We joked about that earlier, but something like that or sports management, which wasn't really something people were like talking about at the time. But I think I could have been really good uh, doing something like that or maybe found my way, you know, to like a, in, in, to something within a pro sports franchise. I mean, I, I just – coming out of high school, I think I, I rushed it. I went into chemical engineering, and then I ended up switching over after a couple years to ID – and great major, loved it, would have, you know, like everyone else that comes out of there, I mean, so many great jobs and so many Aggies that have made, you know, incredible careers for themselves in that, in that field. But I feel like I would have somehow meandered my way to sports. I just don't know what it would have been. I've got uh, – I skipped over a question here. Okay. Uh, best player – best football player to come out of San Antonio. That play for a Hmm. Oh, man, I'm just thinking of the names, you know. Right now, Kellen Mond, Trevor Knight recently. I think Leal and, and Jalen Jones are both, if we have this conversation in two years, I think they would both absolutely be in the discussion. I think they're going to be special, and I think DeMarvin's already – got one foot in that door of, of being great. Not, he, you know what? And I'll say this and answer the question. He might end up being a and best football player this year. I think he could be that good. 
um, as a sophomore. Wow. So I think uh, I saw my guy not too long ago here in the last year or so, you know, Hurricane Hendricks, Mike Hendricks out of Converse Judson was a really nice safety when I was there. Fellow ID major, we did some great class projects together. We still joke about that whenever we, whenever <laughs> we see each other. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm over here. Do you have some names for me? Cause I know I'm forgetting. I'm thinking of the more recent, like a Spencer wow. Neely. Is yeah, Johnny count? Do I? The, is jo well, Johnny uh, count? We're not, that's, that's hill country, right? That's hill country. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, a couple of fan favorites, Spencer Neely, Chris Dawson, Randy Dawson. Dawson, you know, the, oh man. Yeah. Listen, Dawson, Dawson and his crew, like those guys and like uh, Eddie Jasper, Brandon, Brandon Mitchell, Jesse Cox, all those guys were the guys that like kind of when I first started uh, living with the – Brad Crowley, Dan Campbell, Hunter, and those guys. Those were the dudes that, like, uh, took me under their wing. And Dowson, Dowson was a uh, rest in peace, man. He was a great friend and just as passionate as anyone you'll ever, you'll ever meet. So the, him, who else are we forgetting? Man, I – The funny thing is there's not a real. lot – he would – I mean, how do you He's not He's a damn good receiver. How do you not put – Josh right now, as of today, I mean, Josh might actually be the best. I mean, you look at what he did. He, he's a top five, seven receiver, maybe top five, no worse than six or seven uh, receiver in A&M history. And he did it in, in, in the toughest conference A&M's ever been in as well. So, I think you'd absolutely have to have him and – and, you know, Kellen, Kellen, depending on this season, you know, he, it'd be an interesting discussion on where he ranks in a &M history as at quarterback. Let's say, what if a &M went 11-2 and two this year and, and beat Alabama on the road, or beat LSU? At, let's say they went 11-2 and, and they beat LSU at home. So he beat LSU two out of three years and then went and won a cotton bowl against either Oklahoma or dare I say it, Texas, <laughs> you know, then where does that put them? So there, there's an opportunity there, but man, I think you nailed it with Josh Reynolds. And I think uh, obviously there's plenty of people right now sitting there going, you're forgetting this guy. You're forgetting that guy. Cause I know both of us are, I, I don't go back as far as I should with that. Well, without, without getting into the politics too much, uh, you know, you see that uh, there's players at other universities that are that are saying they're going to sit out if they don't get uh, what they're what they're um, asking for, what the change they're asking for. And we know Kellen Mond and some players are are uh, asking for some change on campus. Uh, and uh, you got to respect that as a as a Aggie, as a you know, uh, as a student at A and M. Uh, is there any talk? Is there any chance that that we could be looking at some kind of situation like that for the season? Or I think if you pay attention around around the country, Kansas State, right up the road in Austin, um, you've seen a couple individual players. Think, you know, you, one transferred, one says he's not playing until there's a change. Texas players say they're not going to recruit till there's a change. Um, I think you'd be naive and foolish if you're. Uh, uh, here's the deal. You'd be naive and foolish to think that that can't happen to you if you're in college athletics right now on any level. And so with what's going on with Sol Ross and the statue and, you know, leave it or move it, that whole debate, that's, that's really, I think, tearing, you know, at the soul of A&M right now on, on a lot of levels. If, if you think it's just going away and, and you're not going to have to address it as in just – do something like either whatever you decide, but make a firm decision based on a lot of, uh, you know, consulting with the right people, listening to both sides of that thing and everything. If you, it's not it, to act like that can't happen to you, I think would be incredibly uh, short-sighted and naive. And that doesn't even say what, what you have to do there. 
but to not to think that that's just going away it's not and uh you know it's it's part of what's been so uh unique and, and about this off season is we've never seen anything like it on so many so many levels you know just it's just been not just for a and m sports but for the whole country and, and all of us you know no matter what side you're on no matter if you're in the middle which still to this day so many people do have the ability to say i get it but can we just all sit down you know and by all i mean you sit down with one person i sit down with one person you try to understand somebody you disagree with i try to do the same Texas tries to do the same. Texas A&M tries to do the same. This state, you know, the uh, at all sides of everything. Like, in, in it's just, it's just such a weird time because you want to do all that, but then again, we're also being told, don't go around anyone, don't talk to anyone, don't see anyone, don't travel, don't go, you know, hang out with your friends and loved ones, don't protest, don't you know, don't govern, don't do this, don't do that. So it's, it's really, I think it's such a confusing time. It, it trivializes it so much. I know it's so much bigger, but if we can get sports, I do think that that is a great unifier in this country. And, you know, even if it's sports with no fans, and that's what I'm starting to be, I'm starting to feel like is more and more likely with college football, which I'm, I'm watching a game yesterday, Florida and Auburn last night when you get home from the fireworks or whatever, and you're watching that and I'm going, man, this, even this broadcast would be so weird without fans. But I think right now we're willing to take whatever we can get, you know, for the, for the distraction, for the fun. And I think at the end of the day, uh, political movements aside, uh, political decisions aside, um, what's going on, you know, in the fight for uh, racial equality, which I think is one of the absolute most important things facing our country right now, right there along there with a, with a global pandemic, like all of those things are going to take precedent and they should, and they, they are bigger and they'll always be bigger. But some of this stuff, I think a lot of people would, would really welcome the, the distraction and just the fun, the fun of it. Even these guys that are on opposite sides of the fence, you know, whether it's an a and football team or Austin or K-State or anywhere around the country, even those guys, I know there's part of them that would, they can't wait to get in the locker room and be around their teammates of any and all color, their coaches, and go out there and, and you know, do what they love to do. You know, it's not for, for college kids. It's not a job for college kids. It is passion. It is fun. Um, I'm really interested to see where things go between now and the season, not just at A&M, but around the whole country, but also uh, just in terms of sports, like, can we get the NBA and baseball cranked up? It feels like we are. If we can, I think that'll bode really well for college football in whatever form we might see that. Yeah, I think it'll, it'll help, uh, help everybody get together and, and uh, get past some of these issues. And, um, you know, I, I like that you brought up, it's important to get, get out and talk about it and, and get in front of people. And, and I'd have to, I, I've got to say thanks to Jason Cornelius, my brother-in-law who got me in touch with you. Uh, I know he got a forum together in, in Bryan and College Station uh, last week with, uh, the mayors and the, and the uh, police chiefs and the DA and it was really good productive uh, forum that they had. So I got to say been, he's, he's been my guy for, I don't know, 20 plus years. And just, he's, he's really impactful in the Bryan college station community. Just like his dad. I, I, you know, I knew his dad and his would go to his dad's restaurant back in the day. And, um, it's been fun to watch him. I know he's complimented me before on what's what, you know, what we've been able to do with Tex Ags and, and I feel the same way with just like, you know, just what he's been able to do here as a member of the community, especially now. 
he yeah he he's a great guy and uh thanks to him for uh getting us uh getting us in touch i was wondering what the connection was i didn't know why he was i was like oh yeah it sounds fun i never thought about what it was but there you go brother yeah yeah he's my brother-in-law and i I do give him i do give him a hard time about his age uh he's he's slightly older than i am so i like to uh, razz him about that um Okay, so last question uh, from Reagan Freiling. At uh, he's the uh, treasurer of the San Antonio A&M Club. He okay. he said he wants to know how long have you had the goatee, and have do you have any plan on shaving it? <laughs> ask my mom. Ask any the the last girlfriend I had that I it was. She said I, I would look you know, five years old or younger overnight if I shaved it. And I'm like, can I just dye it? And she said, no, that would, I would look just stupid. And I said, well, what if I, I just look really weird. I feel like without it at this point, I've had it since college. I've had some horrifically bad facial hair decisions over the years, all kind of centering around a goatee, even the weird triangular, uh, one of those deals look like a French painter or something, but so I've had some bad ones. This one, I just kind of settle on and Lord knows I've, uh, uh, the A&M fans are, they have some fun with me, but it's the other fan bases that get particularly uh, ridiculous and vulgar at times with what they call me. But now I think it's just a spite thing. So I don't know. The best thing I heard recently is I grew this out. It's way too gray. It's, it's as gray as this. I had kind of grown it out. And, I, and it, somebody said, well, why don't you just shave this? And if you don't like it, what better time to do it than in the quarantine? And I thought about it. I said, that's true. But I didn't do it. I probably should have. Well, we don't care what those other uh, what those other teams say. We appreciate everything you do for, for A&M and, and for all us fans. And uh, I, I, real quick before I leave, I noticed you, you've always got the golf hats on. We've got a golf tournament we put on. Uh, we've pushed it back a little bit, but uh, we put on a big fundraiser. We're hurting for hurting for raising funds right now, as a, a lot of people are. So we'd love to get you down if we could uh, play in the golf tournament. And, and you don't want to see me play. Now, I've, I've <laughs> been to the Masters once. Um, I was lucky enough to get invited by by some great Aggies a few years, a couple of years ago, two years ago. Um, that was incredible. So I did. I bought. You know, they were like, "You better buy a bunch." So I spent like a thousand dollars buying stuff for everybody, and I kept a bunch of it. And then this one, I don't even know how to bought the straw. I make fun of my good friend Chris Cooper uh, from up there in New Jersey, and uh, I had I had a friend of mine get me this while he was up there so the next time i was around cooper i could show off this hat so for someone that doesn't golf much at all i've got a lot of exclusive golf gear let's say but i do have a driver a putter a three wood a bag some really good stuff because i used to speak every year at the austin a&m club and i'm a lefty so each time i spoke they'd give me hey what club do you want this time And, and i've got some really nice ones I need to get some irons, and if so, then yeah, let's get me down there, to San Antonio, and I'll go. You guys can all laugh at me for a few hours. It'll be fun. Hey, we'll get you hooked up with whatever you need, and uh, even Perfect. if it's uh, pouring beers by Billy Lucci, we can sell them for a little bit more than normal. So, uh, hey, uh, Bill, Bill can't be with us uh, to to close out. His son was in from uh, just got yeah. back from Afghanistan, and so they're having to get together. And uh, so, Billy, thank you very much for uh, joining us and and helping us get, uh, get, keep our club members engaged with what we're doing uh, while we can't meet. So thank you very much. Appreciate All right, it. Logan, I appreciate it. And uh, tell everyone thanks for having me. And, and you guys, thanks. Gig them. Stay safe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all in the fall, hopefully. Kyle Field, maybe 25%, maybe 50 We'll see. Thanks. I hope so. Keep, keep the hopes up. And uh, if they get to play, I think it's going to be a really good football team. So we'll see. All righty. We'll take care of it. We'll see you.